Hi, and welcome to another episode of From the Green Room. I'm Brian Zelmer, director of KU Presents, coming to you from our green room in Schaefer Auditorium at Kutztown University. And uh, we have a really fun show today, but before we get started, I just wanted to let you know that you're welcome to be part of this conversation. Just simply put your uh, remarks or questions into the comments section, whether you're watching on Facebook or YouTube, and we'll try to get to that during the program. Also, if you're watching this as a recording after the live broadcast, feel free to still enter your comments and uh, we'll try to get to them if they're questions or you know, we'd like to see what you have to say. So, uh, so let's get started. We've got a great discussion today about mallet percussion and I'm honored to have two incredible guests joining me today. First, I'd like to introduce Dr. Frank Kumar, uh, who among his many roles is the current KU Music Faculty Chair and Assistant Director of Percussion Studies. Welcome Dr. Kumar. And feel free to call me Frank, Brian. Thank you, Frank. It's great to have you. For those tuning in uh, who may not quite know what mallet percussion means, can you possibly just describe that real quick and give us a few examples? Sure. Uh, mallet percussion, we generally refer to as anything that is a keyboard pitched instrument. So xylophone, marimba, vibraphone, uh, orchestra bells. And at the Center for Mallet Percussion Research, we have a whole bunch of uh, oddball instruments from one off to uh, not so common, different types of marimba phones and song bells and all those kinds of things. Very cool. So I'm just curious before we get into it, how did you personally come to discover mallet percussion and uh, what inspired you to pursue it as a career? Well, I uh, actually, I started studying music really early on. Um, I was around two, or second grade. I was in second grade when I started and I wanted to play the organ. The, the church that I grew up in had a huge pipe organ and I loved the sound of that thing. and um, but I really didn't like playing it all that much. So I played, studied that for about six years or so. And then I got to high school um, and I got into band after that. Well, I shouldn't say I didn't get into band. My friend asked me to play cymbals in the marching band because they needed a cymbal player. And from the first crash, I was, I was hooked into percussion. And then when I found, uh, I didn't really start playing keyboard percussion other than whatever band parts until I got to KU. Uh, as a student, I came to study with uh, Dr. Rapp, and um, when I got here, I heard the marimba for the first time, and that combination of the feeling I get from playing a drum to the sound that I got from the organ combined, and it's like, boom, I really just fell in love with the instrument, and it was a great sort of combination of uh, ingredients, and from there, I went running. That's really awesome. So there's a new center for mallet percussion research planned to be built and completed by mid next year, named for two prominent figures here at KU, uh, especially regarding the music department, namely Mr. Richard Wells and Dr. Rapp. Um, and we're fortunate to have Dr. Rapp joining us today. Why don't we bring him into the conversation? His illustrious uh, resume is a thing of legend, but among the long list of his awards and achievements, including most recently being named, uh, being the conductor of the Reading Pops Orchestra. He was also given the distinction of Professor Emeritus by uh, Kutztown University. And he was most recently inducted as part of the inaugural class into the new KU Arts Hall of Fame. Welcome, Dr. Rapp. Well, thank you, Brian. And again, uh, feel free to call me Will. We're all good friends here. <laughs> thank you, Will. Thank you. So. Uh, I understand that you created the Percussion Studies program here in 1986, is that correct? Yes, uh, it was Richard Wells who actually contacted me about uh, considering applying for the assistant professor position, which was tied to the band program. But he said, you know, you can also start a percussion program when you come. And uh, oh, so, cool. so I did uh, with uh, humble beginnings and a very few instruments, but some really really great and talented students, uh, uh, Frank Kumar being one of them, and uh, it all developed from there. So I'm gonna ask you the same question I asked Frank, when did you discover your personal passion for mallet percussion uh, music and, and what inspired you to keep uh, that drive going even after retirement? Well, it goes back to a few years actually before I got to Kutztown University. I had the opportunity in 1979 to get Claire Omar Musser, who was a native of Mannheim, Pennsylvania, to come back from his home in Studio City, California, to guest conduct a concert made up of the living members of his 1935 International Marimba Symphony Orchestra. This was a 100-piece group of musicians that played nothing but marimbas, 
and they toured Europe and they actually played a very famous concert in Carnegie Hall in New York. And having Musser come and spend some time with, with my students and, uh, and meeting these people who were so close to him way back from 1935, uh, I just thought, boy, this is something really, really special. Fortunately, one of the members from that 1935 group had copied out all the parts for all the pieces from that tour. So we had access to all the music and we kept uh, <laughs> working off of those manuscripts for many years. Uh, till I finally had time to produce a critical edition uh, set of these uh, in four volumes. And then uh, it was in 2014 when Frank and I were approached about would we like to acquire some of the personal instruments of Claire Musser, plus many, uh, many of his books and music and recordings and whatnot. Well, well why would we say no to that? <laughs> And that that's where the Center for Mallet Percussion Research was born. So it started in 2014 with that donation. Is that that's correct? Yes. Yes. So so that leads us to you, over the years, uh, the center has acquired several different um, collections now. Um, so maybe if I, I've got the list here, hopefully it's complete. If I just mention them real quick, and maybe you mentioned the Omar Musser collection, what that is. Um, but if I say the William L. Kahn collection, what does that mean? It was donated in 2015? Yes, that was the, uh, Bill Kahn is a, a percussionist with the famous group Nexus Percussion Ensemble. And he also has been a historian and really a, an amazing uh, documentarian, basically, of all of this uh, old uh, xylophone music from recording, specifically from 1877 through 1933. And he himself over the years has digitized that collection. And so we have the hard disks, which are really hard disks, you know, they're 78 records. And uh, they are all boxed and, and organized and the, the, the collection has been digitized and it has an index. So all of that music, um, I forget, Will, how many exactly totaling in there. It's around 1,500 or something, I it think. Is, wow. yeah. Now, it, holy cow. <laughs> so that, and they're all unique recordings. And so it's really cool for um, the uh, students now. We had, in fact, yesterday and the day before, we had the West Virginia University Percussion Ensemble on campus. They were here, for, they, they uh, streamed a concert out of the Georgia Room yesterday on the instrument for themselves. Very and cool. Very cool. So it was very nice. And so we've had many people come in, and I get a phone call to say, hey, I need this recording from so and so. Can you tell me what? who's on it or something like that. And, and again, we have all of that from the Bill Kahn collection. That's amazing. And then I, I see the Gordon B. Peters Chamber Music Library for Marimba Ensemble. I'm assuming that's all music? Uh, it is. Music? It okay. is. And that was a situation where Gordon Peters was the founding member of the Eastman Marimba Masters. And uh, in 2015, we recognized their 50th anniversary and got many of the masters to, to come back to Kutztown University and perform on a concert there. And he was so taken by what we were doing, he had uh, disclosed to us that over the years he had been paying uh, uh, transcribers to take his manuscript scores and put them into a music software program to generate a clean score and set of parts and that he intended to give us this entire library, which is over 300 titles that he has arranged, starting from his student days in the 1950s uh, up until last year, where he has still continued to arrange and transcribe. So he has uh, methodically sent us all of his manuscript scores and parts. Uh, they reside in 10 different containers, and uh, the, the collection uh, has been digitized. It's available. You can you can go to the Center for Mallet Percussion Research homepage and click the Gordon Peters music file and search the different titles. It's mm -hmm. uh, quite an amazing collection that he has shared with us. So I, I, the next one, I see there's two more. Vita Chenoweth collection, which uh, was acquired in 2017. And I guess there's a connection with back to Musser to our original collection uh, with her. Is that correct? Or is it him? I'm sorry. No, that's this is she. Yes, uh, oh, okay. <laughs> uh, that is true. Uh, she was a student of uh, Claire Musser, and she developed uh, also. Uh, she developed a lot of literature based on the history of some of the instruments. She wrote uh, a famous book 
uh, about the marimbas of, in Guatemala, and she has uh, done. She's been a great musicologist, and not her, her, it hasn't only stopped at mallet percussion. She's gone into way more other areas, but her contri contributions early on were towards mallet percussion. She was uh, a great concertizer. She performed solos with orchestras and so solo recitals. Um, and the there's a famous uh, concerto that is one of the first concerti written for marimba and orchestra with the uh, Paul Creston concertino for marimba and orchestra. And she was one of the first performers of that piece. I don't believe she was the premier, Will. Is that correct? But she no, was no, but she was an early champion of that piece as well as the uh, Sarmientos, which you might remember. Mm -hmm. Right, and that was another uh, one of the famous pieces, and uh, her connection just kind of grew, grew into this. And uh, her, I guess it was her niece, uh, got uh, news of us and uh, shared it with another fellow percussionist that I knew from Texas. And he, I had, a, I was at uh, Texas Bandmasters to do a, a clinic, and he approached me about um, housing the Vitachenowitz materials, which is really cool. Wow. And so the latest collection I saw was acquired in 2018, the Green Family Collection. Uh, can you tell us what that is? Yeah, very exciting collection. Uh, the, the Green Brothers were the two legendary xylophonists, uh, George Hamilton Green and his older brother, Joe Green. And actually, for those who are interested, the original uh, Disney Steamboat Willie cartoon has a very prominent xylophone part in that was recorded by George Hamilton Green. Uh, he and his brother Joe were like the rock stars of xylophone in their day. And there was a third brother, Lou Green, who was the banjo player in the band. Lou's son, Lou Green Jr., has become a very close friend of ours. And, and he and his wife, Mary, have uh, he, they've had Frank and I up to their home in Connecticut, uh, looking at their collection and going through things. and cataloging them. We spent uh, an entire day and a half there. And then as a bit of a surprise to us at the conclusion of that, Mary says to Lou, well, Lou, you're ready to get this stuff out of here. <laughs> <laughs> Next thing you know, we're loading up Frank's car with <laughs> wow, wow. Quite a materials, but it's uh, uh, Green's mother uh, kept a scrapbook for each brother and their father, who was a bandmaster. Their father uh, George Green Sr. was a contemporary of John Philip Sousa. So we have a scrapbook uh, with some letters back and forth between Sousa and, mm. and Green Sr. Uh, and again, Edison cylinder discs and uh, uh, publicity photos that were just so mm. well done back then. That's all been entrusted to us now. So, so each of these collections and, and the wide range of things from rare instruments to the recordings and music and everything else will have a place uh, in this new center. Is that, am I correct? That, um, that is correct. And this is so the public can come or is it only for students to come in and experience it and, and check it out and learn about it? I Anybody who wants to come can come. Uh, in fact, today we had a gentleman who reached out to me because he saw our feature on CBS Sunday Morning He's making uh, some sort of synthetic keyboard instrument for his grandkids. So he wanted to come and check out our instruments today. So I gave yeah. him a tour and he was asking all kinds of questions about just the instruments themselves. So he got to see the construction he's got. To, so again, he's just a, a, a citizen of, of Lehigh County that just came out to see us. And so that was a fun, fun tour to do today. I want to try something real quick because uh, there is uh, a video out there of the conceptual renderings uh, and, and it kind of brings you through what the concept of the building is. And if uh, Christina will play that in a moment, and if one of you could just kind of, I know it goes kind of quickly, but if you could try your best to maybe uh, tell us real quickly, like <laughs> what we're seeing and, and experiencing, sure. let's, let's go ahead and try that. So Christina will bring that up. She's in the background there. And, uh, and this is the concept, so. This is Looking, the main entrance, I'm assuming. Looking across the parking lot from the BAME Science Science Center, okay. and uh, this would be the main entry and uh, patio area in front. We're walking down and noticing uh, beautiful glass panels that display the large 2100 square foot rehearsal hall and performance hall. Uh, as we enter the building now, 
Uh, you'll see stairwell to the second floor. Real quickly, you'll see two exhibit rooms off to the left. Uh, a third exhibit room around the corner from the elevator. And now this takes us into the performance hall itself. We've worked with acoustical as well as theatrical lighting consultants to make sure that the room is going to be uh, acoustically proper for marimba performance. Uh, basically, the scale is a two-story height with a small balcony as part of the theater. And then we're nice. exiting now the balcony. This is the second floor. There's another exhibit room. And there are two more exhibit rooms uh, to the left of that, as well as a director's office. There's a full basement that's going to have a large marimba collection, a large xylophone collection, a room dedicated to the steel drums, and then a huge storage area underneath the performance hall for the archival material that will not be on display, but yet available to those who wish to see it. Very cool. So it might just be me, but I this seems like a very unique um, uh, thing that we have here at Kutztown University now with the center, or, or am I wrong? I mean, it seems not only unique to me for any university, but just something unique in the US or even the world. It, am I wrong in thinking that? No, no, you're not wrong, Brian. Uh, there is another museum out in Indianapolis that's associated with the Percussive Arts Society. Uh, they have the Rhythm Discovery Center. That museum is really more general. Um, there are, they do have uh, some rare instruments and whatnot out there as well. Um, the big difference between their collection and our collection, um, ours is going to be much more readily accessible. The, the space that the, the, that the Rhythm Center has it's somewhat limited in terms of the public ability to get to the documentations and things like that. You have to really plan ahead to do that. I, I, I feel like what makes our special, our center very special is that anyone could come at any given time and be able to get what they access to what they need so far. I mean, we're not so big yet that we're running out of space in the new building, but <laughs> I hope we have some time before that happens. <laughs> um, but we're now That's working incredible. with, when we're working with our library uh, science department on campus and we've been assigned an intern. So uh, we will eventually um, have uh, software through the university and uh, cataloging and we'll, we'll be really, everything will be very readily accessible as we start to prepare for our new building. That, that kind of brings us to our, every week we have a commercial music student uh, submits a question and that's right right along with this week's question. It says, will there be opportunities for commercial music majors to gain practical experience in performance, music business, and or audio engineering at the new center? Of course, I mean, it's the, well, the, uh, we, Will and I were in so many long meetings to pick out the uh, audio, video, and all of the media components. And uh, I think now uh, we have, it's currently will be set up to meet the standard of now what we have our current technology for streaming and, and playback and video. And so there certainly will be opportunities for students there. And again, just because the space is for percussion, uh, we do hope that the department itself will make use of the performance space and smaller right. titles and whatnot. Um, but then again, the, the internships that we've, uh, I've spoken to uh, communications those studies to get a, uh, a media, uh, what do you call it? A social media tech, uh, intern. Intern, okay. Yeah, okay. so we'll have a social media intern and then uh, I'll continue to have library science interns. We're just about out of time, but before we depart, I just want to play a little bit of a video clip uh, that contains some words spoken by the other namesake of the new center, uh, KU faculty emeritus, Mr. Richard Wells, uh, and then we'll come back and wrap up. So let's just take a look at that video. We are so involved in education and helping the students of today for tomorrow, because whatever we can do, we will try to help and do that. There's nothing better than music to promote the feelings and emotional outlets for the human being. The doors wide open for anyone in music to create whatever they want to create. Whether it's a passion that I always have with me, as I said before, I want to, as long as I live, enjoy the music because it is the soul of my life. How beautiful. I, 
just to paraphrase, let's enjoy the music because it's the soul of our lives. I, I just love that. Um, and I think that's a great way to end. But before we do, I want to let people know how we can uh, let people know how they can learn more about the center, how they could follow the progress of the construction and eventually come in, and visit you. So where, where do people find out information? Very simple. Uh, www.kuf.org. So it's Kutztown University Foundation, www.kuf.org. And there's a whole web page devoted to this. The videos are there. The, uh, the, the walkthrough is there. And much more information will be added as the project progresses. Great. Well, we're out of time. And I want to thank you both for giving your time to talk about the new uh, Wells Rap Center for Mallet Percussion Research. I know I'm very excited uh, just to be able to go and, and be an audience member and check out the exhibits and, and, um, and the collections. And so uh, thank you again for, for taking time to talk with me today. Thank you for the invitation. And thank you for having us. All right. We'll see you soon. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for, for tuning in and checking out this program. Be sure to like, subscribe, share, whatever you can do to help us get the word out. Um, I also want to thank one more time Drs. Will Rapp and Frank Kumar uh, for being part of our program today. And I'd like to invite you to tune in next week for our final episode this semester uh, when we chat with kindy rock star Lori Berkner, um, which I'm really excited about. All my kids grew up with her music. So. Uh, until then, I'm Brian Zelmer for KU Presents, and I look forward to seeing you right here next Wednesday, live at 4 p.m. Eastern, as we come to you from the green room. <laughs>